Welcome to our First Essentials Bible Study. We are done with the study of the book of Genesis. And starting next week, what's planned now <clears throat> is for us to do a uh, study on the missionary journeys of Paul in his life. But this week, before um, we get into that, I've been reading a book uh, about a man named John G. Patton. And uh, this is what the book looks like. And he was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands uh, back in the 19th century. I became aware of him, um, I guess about maybe 10, 15 years ago, I read a book uh, by John Piper that had some brief uh, missionary biographies, and he was one of them. And then since then, I ended up getting that book, uh, read bits and pieces of it here and there. But uh, during the uh, lockdown here, I have had uh, some more time to read. And so I've read most of that book, um, the parts that I have not read before. And uh, it's a fascinating book, so much so that I thought it'd be good to do a quick um, introduction of his life and how he lived. So I want to go um, through this little slide here. I'm going to tell a lot of stories. At the end, we'll have a point where we apply it and kind of talk about why we do, why we do missionary biographies and how they can help us. We're just going to talk about his life. And as you can see from this picture, he has a much more spectacular beard than I ever had uh, before I cut it uh, short. Um, a few months back. So let's start. Um, John G. Patton. Well, as I said, he was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. They were in the South Pacific, uh, kind of around uh, north of Australia and New Zealand. And you can see a map to the left over here of back in the day how they uh, saw the New Hebrides and the Loyalty Islands um, all together there. And you can see there's lots of them. Little ones, big ones. Also, this is uh, the, the modern day nations that make up um, those islands. And if you've heard of Vanuatu, uh, that's the name of the nation today. Um, and you can see a picture down at the bottom of Captain John Cook in the late 18th century coming inland. Now, the natives on the New Hebrides Islands were cannibals. They were what we used to call headhunters, and uh, they had various idols and little charms they worshipped. Magic ruled their uh, islands, and that they were these sacred men who could control the spirits and send evil spirits on people. And uh, what they would do was if they captured some uh, natives from another island or another tribe um, in warfare, they would eat them. So um, eating was, was not just something they did like, hey, I'm hungry for human, but it was usually uh, a way to shame and, uh, and feast upon one's, uh, one's opponents after a victorious raid during a war. And so, um, you know, not the most uh, civilized way of living, but, um, you know, it, it happens. Um, so we've got some facts here uh, about um, John G. Patton. Now he was born in Scotland, um, which there's a map of it to the left. And uh, he lived in the south of Scotland up against the English border on the eastern side. Um, he was Presbyterian. Most Scottish back in that time were. Presbyterians, uh, historical reasons. The uh, Scottish were heavily um, influenced by continental Protestant uh, movements, and the nation, most of them, covenanted together to form a national church. Um, and John Knox was instrumental in this in the uh, 16th century, and they were strong uh, Presbyterians. The Presbyterian Church at this time had good relationships with the uh, Baptists in England, uh, the particular Baptists in England especially, and the Presbyterians and Congregationalists 
in England. There was a lot of um, friendly relationships across the border because the kingdoms were united. And uh, Presbyterians at this time had a massive missions movement going. So it was said that in Scotland, one out of every six, so about 18% of all pastors were on the foreign mission field. One out of six. Now, they had a very close relationship with the Presbyterian Church in Nova Scotia, out, out, off the coast of Canada. Both uh, were under the British crown, and the churches in Nova Scotia had one in three ordained pastors on the mission field. So there was a huge missions movement going on at the time. One in six Scottish Presbyterian pastors on the mission field, one in three Nova Scotian Presbyterian pastors on the mission field. Now they also cooperated with the London Missionary Society. They cooperated with Baptists and Congregationalists. That they, they all these denominations cooperated together in advancing the gospel. Um, he was uh, born in Scotland, as I said, Presbyterian, and he had very godly parents. Uh, there are some stories of his parents that, that will make you uh, tear up in this book, and he had nine siblings. Um, he was called to missions in his youth. He knew he wanted to serve God on the foreign mission field, and he would work at his father's shop, um, you know, 12 hours a day. Uh, his father was a bit of a stocking repairman. Um, I know stockings are really big back then as a fashion accessory, and that's just how people dressed. Um, but his father would, would make stockings. His father also ran a store, and John would help his father with that, and during both of his meal breaks, two hours a day, he would study. So he studied and studied uh, theology and language, and for, for his mission uh, preparation, he studied medicine, um, he just was all the way around a fully formed uh, person with all the studying he did. Um, and later on in his life, it well served him because as he went on the mission field, there was no help whatsoever. And he had to do most things by himself. Um, there's a story of when he left to go to the mission field, to the New Hebrides Islands. Um, there's a story in the book about his father walking him to the train station and said that his father, you know, talked with him about spiritual things along the way and at the end uh, gave him over to God with tears in his eyes. They wept, they hugged, and his father could go no further. He walked around this big, um, this big wall of earth and turned a corner, and he said that he climbed up the other side to see what his father was doing, and he said he found that his father was climbing up the other side of the wall of earth looking for him, and he kind of you know, hid because he didn't want to be <laughs> spotted by his father looking back for him, that his father kind of sat there kind of praying and crying until finally he couldn't see his son, and he turned around, and he said, I watched my father walk away with a heavy heart, but I knew at that moment I must live in a way to never let that man down, and so his father was an instrumental figure in his upbringing and helped him remain faithful during many temptations, he said. So uh, his mother also, a godly woman, and, um, and his brothers and sisters, uh, godly people, all raised in the faith, and, uh, and off he went to the mission field. So whenever he gets there, um, let's talk about, he goes to uh, the island of Tana, which is one of the southern islands, um, you can see it right down here. It's a big island towards the south of the New Hebrides um, near Anidium, which was an island that had been evangelized about 15 years before. And when he got there, they actually sent Anitiyi's native teachers to teach the Tana, uh, as they call them, heathens, about the gospel. So they get there in 1858, and he builds this mission house, which is a big open house, like a compound, where the teachers live, where he and his wife live, and they begin by befriending some of the local chiefs and teaching on Sabbath days. Uh, Presbyterian Reformed really believe that Sunday is a new Sabbath, and they keep it pretty rigidly. Um, all you're allowed to do is, uh, 
is religious observances. You cook the day before. It's, it's almost like a very Jewish observance. If you read um, any old confessions of faith, such as the Westminster Confession, or even the London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is where uh, Southern Baptists draw a lot from the heritage of the English Baptists. But the London Baptist Confession of Faith is heavily dependent upon the Westminster Confession of Faith, which Presbyterians still use today. But if you read that, they are serious about the Lord's Day being a Sabbath. So they would tell the natives not to work, not to hunt, not to fight, um, and these natives love to kill each other over these uh, arguments and revenge cycles that would go on and actually cause tribal warfare on this island. But they would start teaching in these villages on the Sabbath. These Anitaese teachers and John Patton and his wife, they began learning the language and trying to interpret the gospel into the Tana language. And so they went around to villages and they would find some villages very open to the gospel. Some, some chiefs even began to say that they were Christians and worshipers of Jehovah and not their idols, but other chiefs would run the teachers out, would threaten to kill the missionaries, and they would kick them out of their villages. And so during this time, there's a few conversions, but for the most part, um, John Patton and his wife and all the Christian natives run into a lot of opposition. Some of the teachers are murdered. There's another couple, um, a missionary couple on the northern side of the island. They're older and they get sick a lot and they're always threatened. And so throughout this book, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Patton continues his ministry, um, there are oftentimes that armed bands of headhunters come to his, uh, to his house or point rifles at him point uh, bows and arrows at him, will take clubs and axes and swing at him. Um, they had this thing called a killing stone, which was a long cylinder of almost like a rock arrow, uh, long and skinny, that they would throw through the air, almost like a javelin. And it, was, it wasn't sharp, it was blunt, but it had a point. And they said that they would throw those at him and they barely missed him at times. And he would go up to these natives and he would oftentimes try to embrace them so that they would not hit him with clubs. And he would tell them, he'd say, I am your friend. I love you. I'm here for your good to teach you about Jesus and Jehovah. But you are out trying to murder me, a man who has given you gifts and helped you grow food. And so he would appeal to their sense of conscience and their sense of right and wrong. And many times these natives would leave him alone just because he had told them, how wicked they were behaving. But what ends up happening is his wife and child get sick. There was a, they call it a ague, but it was a type of fever from the humidity and from damp swampy air that would come up during the wet season. And uh, Mr. Patton was often stricken with it and his wife and he has a newborn son. The wife right after childbirth, about two weeks after childbirth, she passes away. And uh, about two weeks or three weeks after that, his son, uh, Peter, also passes away. And he buries them together, and he is just despondent. But he continues in the work. Um, during this time, many village chiefs begin fighting a war against each other. Now, the war was not because of him. As he said, these headhunters, these cannibals, loved warfare, even though it was very disorganized. They would get uh, muskets from the European traders. They would trade coconuts and breadfruit and, and slaves to these Europeans. They'd get muskets and they'd run around the islands shooting at each other in these war parties, stealing, uh, just murdering. And then they'd go back to their village. And a few weeks later, that village would get stuff together and come back and attack them. And so these long blood feuds would continue. Well, because they were so superstitious, and believe that everything was because of evil spirits and evil magic, sometimes uh, they would get sick and they would blame somebody in the village. So if you got sick in the village, you would blame someone who maybe lived three houses down and who said something mean to you one time. Now, that person made me sick. So all of your friends would gather together gifts or food or fruit or weapons and give to this person. And if you got well, 
your friends would brag and say, look, we gave so much to make you well. Now we're good friends. You owe us back. But if you didn't get well, if you stayed sick or even if you died, then your friends might seek revenge on this man down the street that they just happened to think made you sick. We're using his magic uh, against you. And so they might go one night and murder this person. And then their family would come back and murder them and it would start these war these wars all over again. Well, one thing that uh, Reverend Patton tried to do was he would find out where the bands of warriors are going to meet to fight, and he would walk out in the middle of them. He would plead with them. He'd say, Jehovah commands in his law that man should not kill man. If you murder each other, Jehovah will be displeased, and he might punish you. And so he would talk them out of fighting. Sometimes he could talk them out of fighting. Sometimes he couldn't. But what ends up happening is these village chiefs go, this man, this missionary, they call him a missy, this missy, he keeps us from living the ways our fathers lived. And we don't like that. So they tried their best to kill him. They would come to his house at night and try to start a fire, but the uh, local Anitui's native teachers would put out the fire or warn him. He had these two little dogs that would chase after the natives. The natives were scared of the dogs, they're little terriers. And so he ends up um, surviving for uh, over a year, just as it seems like every day he has uh, a sore trial of it. But these chiefs are so mad. Now, two chiefs really support him. Um, one especially named Noar, is says he's a Christian, even though he continues to fight in wars and live his own way and even eat some, some body parts sent to him from some captives. And so he's living one half in paganism and one half in Christianity, but he tries to protect Reverend Patton. But as more and more chiefs get angry with him and start to blame him for stuff, his situation is really precarious and he can't, um, he really can't, uh, do much work there. And so what ends up happening is as the wars continue, some European traders and these European traders did not like missionaries because they tried to keep them from getting uh, slaves. They tried to keep them from selling weapons and alcohol to the natives. Uh, they were ruining all their fun. And so one day these traders let loose several people with measles on the island. The native immune system had no contact with measles. Measles is highly contagious. And so these measle-infected uh, people run through the countryside and all the natives start getting sick. Um, he, John Patton would go from village to village um, with other missionaries who would come there and they would try to treat the natives for measles with what medicine they had, but he said in many villages, one out of three people would die from the sickness. Um, many more would be, you know, laying in fever um, for weeks. And so it gives these, uh, it gives the missionaries a bad name because Europeans had let the measles run. And uh, during the middle of this, a husband and wife team who was with Reverend Patton end up um, dying also, not of measles, but of uh, different complications during the epidemic of measles. And so he's left alone again, except for one trusty servant, another uh, saved native whose name is Abraham. And he sticks with him through the whole trial. So the war starts back when the measles are gone, and many of the chiefs blame. Uh, Mr. Patton for the measles. And so he's, he's really seeing no option. And he says, I, I was kind of um, hesitant to leave. I thought I might just die on Tana for these people. But he also knows that if it's not his time to go, it would be wrong to ruin his life. So he ends up um, trying to make an escape with the, with the people who are with him, with the loyal Christian native teachers and Abraham, his friend, and his dog. Um, and they run, and several chiefs help them, and they end up getting a boat, but the boat gets stranded, and they get washed back up on shore. They end up 
running at night through trails and this one last chief decides I'm going to help him and they end up fleeing the island and they get to another island and realize that uh, they can do no work on Tana right now because the natives are too angry. They said they will kill him the minute he steps foot back. They steal everything he has. They burn his house and he has nowhere to go. So he ends up going to Australia where a local, the Australian Presbyterian Missionary Society um, helps him and he has a new plan to kind of re-engage the island. So just to wrap up where we are now, um, for the first uh, four years of his ministry, really, he is, uh, he is um, stuck, you know, no real fruit. The natives hate him. He loses his family and he's back in Australia. And so um, he wants to go back as soon as possible, but he says, we have a problem. We don't have a boat. Every time they needed supplies, they had to have a shipping company send them supplies through a boat. This is back in the day when they were, um, when it was sail ships mainly, no, not, not a lot of steamships. And so the weather could be finicky, ships may not get the right uh, breeze. And so you're always dependent on um, hiring a ship to bring supplies. Well, they had this idea. What if the churches in Australia can pull their money together, all the Presbyterian churches, and buy a ship? And this ship would be outfitted to do nothing but help the missionaries. Because all these islands around there are dozens of missionaries out there. They could uh, take them workers. They could remove them when there's uh, safety issues. And they could bring supplies. So he tours Australia, preaching at churches and sharing, especially for the children's meetings, like the children's Sunday school. And he tells them, would you like to own a ship? So he makes them stockholders in this ship called the Day Spring. And he tours Australia and gets a bunch of money. And they have enough money after like a year to have this company in Nova Scotia build a ship for the mission. So after he does this, the Missionary Society says, well, now what we need is we need more trained pastors. And Australia did not have enough pastors. They needed more trained pastors to work in the islands. So they said, why don't you return to Scotland, raise some money there, and find more missionaries. Well, he doesn't want to at first, but they prevail upon him, and he prays, and he says, okay, I'm going back to Scotland. So he returns to Scotland. He sees his parents again, which is another great story about his parents. They pray over him, and, and he leaves them, and it's the last time in this world he says he saw them. Um, while he's there, he finds more missionaries. He gets more money for the mission, and he marries a young lady named Maggie Whitecross, who becomes, for the next uh, 40 years, uh, his wife and mother of several children. Uh, so there's also a story in there about, um, about him uh, going across um, Scotland and sharing with different churches about the mission and sharing how uh, the Lord um, helped. And that's whenever uh, I ran across the statistic where one in six Scottish pastors at this point were, were dedicated to the foreign mission field and one in three Nova Scotian pastors. So he's really helping keep this steady stream of missionaries going into the, into the colonies of the British Empire and evangelizing. So um, he does this for a while. Um, as you know, he arrived uh, on 10 in 1858. He left in 1862, I believe, and now uh, we're to 1866. He returns, and they go to a different island. Um, the, the people um, for the Mission Society say, do not go back to Tana. They have killed too many missionaries. It's not the time. So they send him to an island called Aniwa. Aniwa was a smaller island. It had less rain, um, a very interesting, uh, like an extinct volcano on one end. It was only two miles across and seven miles 
wide. So think about Okaloosa Island, but maybe double the width. Um, and 300 feet uh, was the highest point on it, overlooking the sea. So uh, it had it it had a uh, uh, you know like a volcanic base and a small mountain on one end, and uh, several thousand uh, natives lived on it. So he goes to this island in 1866, the second island he's serving on, and he builds uh, another mission house. Now, what's interesting is this island did not have uh, any Christians on it, no Christians. And uh, when he gets there, they've heard about the missionaries from other lands, and they like them because they bring fish hooks, and they bring uh, fancy cloth and, you know, clothes. And so he likes, uh, or they like, missionaries, but not because of their teaching. So the chiefs are all looking at him, and they say, here's what we'll do. He wants to build a house. Let's put him on the cursed land that our fathers taught us. No man can live on this land or they will die. And if they eat fruit from banana trees that grow on this land, they will die. Let's put him on this cursed land. And when he dies, we can take all his stuff and split it up between us. So they're planning on plundering him after he dies from evil spirits from cursed land. And uh, whenever he gets there, um, and builds the house there. It talks about how he, uh, and it was interesting is how much knowledge this guy had of how to build houses, treat diseases, um, grow crops. Uh, to be a missionary back then, you had to have knowledge of almost every field because when you got to a foreign place, if you didn't know how to build your own house, you couldn't hire anyone to build a house. If you didn't know how to treat water, you couldn't drink the water. If you don't know how to grow food in that climate, you couldn't grow food. So he ends up uh, building a house out of coral rocks. They, they take all this compressed coral from the seafloor. He pays the uh, natives in fish hooks to dive down and to lift up these giant coral rocks. And they make um, a brick foundation out of coral and raise up this, this house on it. And the house is on a high point so that the sea breeze uh, conditions it and makes it uh, dry and nice and temperate. And they make a large uh, flat uh, field around it where they can uh, put other small buildings for the teachers and have a church and grow crops. And so he ends up being on this cursed land and all the chiefs just sit and they watch him. They say, he's going to die. He's going to die. Well, he doesn't. He ends up actually planting food there and eating the food. And they say, well, this is going to do it now. He's going to eat the food from the cursed land. And he doesn't die. So all the chiefs start looking at each other and they say, I think his God is stronger than our God or our gods. And so they start watching him. Well, a few people start to convert, but most of the island is still going, we don't want this stuff. We want to live our way. So they try to kill him. The book is filled with stories about um, Indians coming in and wanting to, uh, uh, one of them sneaks up and is going to try to kill his wife, but then at the last minute, he gets scared and he runs away. And Reverend Patton just says, you know, God watched after us time and time again. Well, they, they start educating some of the children of the chiefs, and those children from the village come there, and they start dressing in European fashion and learning the alphabet and learning the Bible. And they become best friends in the orphanage house with the missionaries. And so they'll start telling them, um, our relatives are coming up trying to burn your house down tonight. Watch out. So then the missionaries will all stay out and stop the people from gathering wood and trying to start a fire. And they'll say, who told you we were going to burn your house? And they never told them that the kids told them. They say, well, a bird from the, a bird from the woods told us. So the kids you're protected and they think it's, uh, you know, that these missionaries are wonderful and they protect them from their own family and relatives trying to hurt them. Well, things continue and uh, it ends up that because the island is so dry, they need to dig a well. And they say, well, it's probably going to be 35, 40 feet down until we get to water. And who knows if it's going to be salt water or pure water because this island has no stream. You have to catch rainwater, and during the dry season, it, it, there's nothing. You have to drink coconut water or sugarcane for the liquid. 
but there's not enough water for what they need. So he prays, he prays, he prays, and Reverend Patton prays, and he says, I just started, I picked a place and felt that God was going to do something. So he starts digging a well. Well, some of the chiefs who aren't Christians, but they're friendly to him, they start asking him, what are you doing digging a hole in the ground? And he tells them, he says, I'm going to find water. And they say, no, water comes from the sky. You've gone crazy. He says, I'm not crazy. They said, when people go crazy from lack of water, they start looking for water everywhere, and it's, and it's not there. You've gone crazy. So they start, they start really lamenting and saying, oh, the missionary has gone crazy. He thinks he can find water in the dirt. But he tells me, he says, in my country, our God waters us from the ground and the sky. And I pray that he will let us water ourselves from the ground here. They laugh at him. They ridicule him. They feel bad. At one point, the, the, the shaft he's digging collapses in one night, and all the native chiefs are mad because they say, if you go down there and you get crushed, the British will come with a ship and bomb our, our island because they'll think we murdered you. Please don't go back down there. And he says, I have to. So they strengthen it with some, some wood. He goes back down, and after uh, days of digging, he finally hits a place where he says he can see water coming through the gravel. So he digs, he digs, he digs, and finally he calls all the chiefs. He says, y'all come around the top. He says, I'm going to send up something to you. So he takes a little bit of water, and he prays, and he says, God, please let this be fresh. He drinks it, and he says, it was fresh water. So he sends this bucket up, 35 feet up to the top of the well. And the chiefs all look at it and they are shocked. And they go, what is this? He says, water. So they dip their hands in it. They smell it. And finally they drink it. And they all start jumping and dancing saying, the missionary has got rain from the dirt, rain from the dirt. And so at this moment, most of the chiefs, they say, our gods have never produced rain from the ground, only from the sky. But Jehovah God he produces rain from the sky and the ground. He's stronger than our gods. And so Reverend Patton says at this minute, the worship of their false gods was broken on the island of Aniwa. He said that on the Sundays after that, the Indians were bringing their idols to his mission house and trying to burn or break or bury them, saying, we don't want these anymore. We want your God. Well, they, they block in the well. They make it nice and strong. And he says, this well is open to every single person who wants it free of charge. And the Indians can't believe it because now they have a source of water they've never had before in all their history. And through this act, he says, the, the, he calls it heathenism. Heathenism was broken on the island of Aniwa. The whole island ends up over the next few months converting to the gospel. What's interesting is he said, when these Indians converted to the gospel. They gave up their warfare. They gave up stealing. He said it used to be that they would carry everywhere they went their most valuable possessions with them because you couldn't leave anything anywhere or it would get stolen. And now they could leave it in their house. He said that the chiefs would, would instead of murdering each other when something happened, they, they wrote up laws. You know, if someone steals, they get this. If they do this, this is the punishment. And these, these very systematic laws that no longer let a cycle of revenge happen. He said they began to dress appropriately and, and, and not run around dancing and doing crazy uh, nature worship. He said, and he didn't teach them um, all of those specific rules. They just came naturally as the Indians converted to worshiping God. They changed their entire way of living. They, they changed their entire uh, outlook on life because uh, this missionary struck water with a well, and instead of keeping it to himself, said, this belongs to the whole island. So God used that uh, sinking of that well to completely um, convert that island. Well, the island was converted, and, and he uh, labored there many more years, he and his wife together working to teach them, to train their children. Um, more missionaries came to other islands, and even towards the end of his life, 
his own uh, first island of Tana um, had several tribes and chiefs become Christians and begin to follow Jesus. Well, he died in 1907. His wife died before him. So um, as you can see, uh, he, he lived a very long, full life. Um, and part of his uh, legacy is uh, still felt in that area because there are many, um, you know, Christians still in those islands who trace uh, their salvation, the salvation of their tribe and their family back to the ministry of John G. Patton. Now, let's, let's talk about the takeaway, the lesson. Um, what can we learn from this old Scottish guy? Um, number one, we can learn patience from Patton. Uh, the amount of opposition he faced was uh, phenomenal in the fact that he faced it by just doing his duty and waiting on God to act. Um, there were times that he would spend entire days with murderous chiefs around him who had loaded muskets pointed at him. And he would just tell them, he said, if you wish to kill me, um, you will, but, but Jehovah will punish you and he will not be pleased. And you know it's an evil because I've been your friend and given you things and helped you, and you only are treating me with evil. And he just kept doing his job. After his family died, after his friends died, um, after many people forsook the work um, of the gospel there, he continued in patience, reminding us what the book of James says is that uh, if we let patience have its perfect work in a time of tribulation and trial, we will be complete, lacking nothing. Um, also, if you read uh, the book, you will find out we can learn how to live in this life. Now, here's what I mean by that. Many places in the book, um, when you look at the opposition that came up against the missionaries working that part of the world, you keep thinking, how could they do this? And he keeps saying the, th the same thing over and over again. We counted it an honor to be so treated in the service of our Lord. Every time um, he was robbed, or every time an Indian took a swing at him with a war club, or every time he had a musket pointed at him, um, he thought it was an honor and, and part of his duty as a Christian to have those things come at him. It, it shows us how we're supposed to live in this life. We're not supposed to be always grumbling when things go wrong. We're not supposed to always be looking for our advantage. We're not supposed to be finding ways to strike down our enemies all the time. Um, as a Christian, in service of the Lord and spreading the gospel, we live in this life by looking forward to the next. There are many times in the book when somebody died or somebody was met with danger that Patton reflects and says, we did our duty, we prayed, and knew that if this is the way that Jesus would take us to the next life, we would meet him gladly. He could deal with all of these struggles in this life because he was looking forward to the next life. Without that hope, that anchor of the soul, as the book of Hebrews says, he would not have been able to weather all this opposition. And the last takeaway from this book is that we can value missions more and comfort less. One in six Presbyterian pastors at that time, one in three Nova Scotian on the missions on the mission field, their churches valued missions. They could have had a very comfortable life in the European civilized world. Now, more so us now having all the comforts we do. Um, but if you go to the third world and become a missionary, more than likely you're going to have air conditioning. More than likely you're going to be around a civilized city with modern amenities. You're going to be able to eat good food. You're going to be able to take, uh, you know, gasoline powered transportation somewhere. Um, we're not talking about going to the New Hebrides Islands uh, again. I know there's still some places like that. But most places where you go to be a missionary today, you have pretty close to the amount of comfort that you do here. 
But back then, you, you hear stories of missionaries burning their ships when they got where they were going because they knew it would be so rough they'd be tempted to leave and they did not want to abandon their post. There are times that Patton is facing impending death, he thinks, but he just says, this was what I signed up for. Um, this is where I'm supposed to be. And in each of those times, he, he talks about how during the suffering, he felt the closeness of the Lord with him more so than at other times. There's one scene where he's hiding up on top of a tree from a band of uh, angry, uh, murderous natives, and they're firing muskets around and throwing stuff. They don't know where he is. They're chasing him, and he's in the top of the branch of this, in the branches of this tree. And he says, um, "I would, I would go through that uh, many more times to have such a wonderful evening uh, with the Lord in that tree." Basically, that he knew that God was so close to him. He didn't even feel the danger. And so he teaches us uh, in this book that as we value the gospel, we value missions, um, our comfort becomes less and less a driver of our actions and our attitude. Um, we begin to view things more as, can I share the gospel through this? Um, it's a very uh, appropriate book to read at this time because we are dealing with uh, you know, in many ways, our comfort is not what it used to be before this virus um, put us all on lockdown. Our uh, existence does seem a little bit more precarious, um, and it teaches us um, not to value this life as much. That the life to come, the one, the treasure that no man can take from us, is what we should be banking on, not what is um, very, very fleeting in this life. And uh, also having to learn some patience, sitting around the house, homeschooling kids, dealing with, uh, you know, grocery runs and things like that. Um, reading this book and seeing how he lived with patience uh, before God has helped me uh, exhibit patience during this time. Um, well, that's a quick sketch of the life of John Patton and how he lived and what it can teach us today as we ask, how can we fulfill the Great Commission where we're at? Uh, hopefully this uh, book will be something you'd be interested in reading yourself. Like I said, if you want to uh, pick it up, I know it's on Amazon. I know that some bookstores online have it, or you can borrow my copy if you uh, let me know. Uh, Missionary Patriarch, The True Story of John G. Patton. And um, you can also read up on him in some of John Piper's The Swans Are Not Silent uh, books, which has a lot of uh, small sketches on different people throughout history. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments or email me. And we'll see you next week for the beginning of the missionary journeys of Paul. Uh, God bless you and have a good week.